we're in Monterey. Uh, we're here with Professor Zinan Ye. Uh, first, can you tell us what you're doing here in, in Monterey uh, at I, the moment? Yeah, I teach Chinese translation. Uh, basically, I only teach translation from English into Chinese. I don't teach translation uh, from Chinese into English. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in addition to written translation, occasionally I also teach sight translation, okay. again into Chinese. Okay, good. Now, uh, I have heard that you are very well known in China. Do you have any idea why that might be so? Uh, well, <laughs> it could be several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons could be my uh, uh, my column writing for the uh, uh, Chinese Translators Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, it's it's a, a very popular column and uh, uh, many young translators and uh, translation students and the professors read this column and I uh, write for them. Uh, I usually take a text of 600 words and I provide my own translation uh, followed by my uh, commentaries, notes, explanations, and uh, that could be one of the reasons because uh, many people read this column, uh, a lot of people know me, know me through this column. That's one reason. The next reason could be, I think every year I go to China to teach for uh, summer programs, uh, there's uh, training programs in China, and uh, through that program, uh, a lot of people know me. I think the third uh, I think then the, my book writing. Okay. So book writing. I wrote several books and published in China. And here is the first one. This is the first one. The first book is uh, The Principles and Practices of English Chinese Translation. Uh, this book was published in 2000 in Taiwan. Uh -huh. And the same book later on was published again. Uh, this is the one, the advanced course uh, in English Chinese Translation. And this time it was published in Beijing by the foreign, Beijing Foreign uh -huh. Studies University. And uh, I think among uh, the books I wrote, I would say this one is most important because it was recommended by the Graduate School of Translation and Inter Interpretation of Beijing Foreign Studies University as one of the three books recommended for the students uh -huh. who wants to get into their program. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, that's the second book, and uh, this book uh, is very popular, and a lot of people know me maybe through this book. Okay. Through this book. And I all, in addition, I also wrote uh, the another book, which is very interesting. This book, I think, is uh, even better written, but not uh, as popular as the, 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 the last one. This one is called A Dialogue on English-Chinese Translation, uh, published in 2003 by Beijing University, and this one is a uh, uh, is written in the form of a dialogue. Uh, there is a student and a professor. They are uh, the student asks the question. The professor answers the question uh, on the topic of a wide range of translation issues. This, uh, this is the one, and these are the three books. Actually, it should be two books. Yeah, uh -huh. because the first two are the, s the same book, okay. published in different places, and the, the, these two books are all, all translations from English into Chinese. And recently I wrote another one, which is this one, the Introduction to Chinese-English Translation. Uh, this time is uh, the targeted language is English. Uh, I uh, co-authored this book with Professor Lynette Shi, and uh, she's a native speaker of English, so this is the third one. This book was published in New York uh, to, I think, last year. The same book, actually later on, was published again, uh, different cover uh, in Taiwan. The same book, and uh, I was told that the book is going to be published again in Beijing later this year or maybe beginning next year. I think through all these uh, column writings, uh, seminars, uh -huh. and the book writings, uh, probably a lot, of, you know, a lot of people know me. You have another book there, which is even more interesting. Oh, that's... Can you tell us where that came from, what you were doing at the time you wrote that? Oh, that's a very 
Uh, interesting. This is the uh, actually before I uh, uh, receive any formal translation training, I had uh, started translating as freelancer mm -hmm. uh, even early in the 1970s. Uh, this is actually a copy, the only copy I have of the first article I translated. Uh, of, I think the the, uh, the topic is about the cancer research. It was published in two, in 1972 uh, when I was in the countryside because that was Good. right in the Cultural Revolution and the young people during that period of time were all asked to go to the countryside uh, to receive a re-education and I was uh, uh, to receive re-education is not that good <laughs> I think yeah I was uh, uh, I was one of those people and uh, uh, I was a farmer. Uh, I worked in the rice field during the day. In the evening, uh, I did translation. You know, that's, uh, that's the you did medical translation. That's, that's medical right. translation. Basic medical translation. Before, uh, I, I did translate did medical translation from 1971 until 1977. Uh, basically, what I did was doing. Uh, cancer research translation and uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases mm -hmm. and the clinical issues. Okay. Uh, so this is while you were working on the farm? Yes. That's while you, you were while being re-educated? We were being re-educated. On the farm first, mm -hmm. uh, for a few years working on the farm as a farmer, doing, you know, planting rice, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, later on, I I also work as a barefoot doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the doctor, country doctor for the for the for the farmers, and okay. uh, and then uh, I also taught in a high school for a few years, and then the Cultural Revolution was over, and I got a chance to go to the university. What's interesting is that translation activities continued throughout the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, I think that most people. Uh, it is true that. Academic research, academic activities totally stopped uh, at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution and uh, for, for quite a few years because the universities actually were closed. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that the practical translation was still going on, mm -hmm. even right in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. I think I should say that uh, I, I, I'm not sure about 1977 or 78, but I think from 1971, starting from 1971, uh, the translation of, of uh, technical documents actually was going on. Okay. Pretty sure. Pretty okay. sure. Yeah. So, so the need for foreign knowledge was still there despite. Despite the evolution of Chinese because, culture. Because, yeah, I think okay. it's still. Uh, I don't know some other areas like, you know, uh, uh, engineering or agriculture. I have no idea. For in terms of medical translation, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure starting from at least as early as 1971, uh, the translation activity was there. Yeah. Okay. How did you get from there to here? How did you get to California? Well, I uh, I was. Uh, translation uh, lecturer in Hangzhou, uh, in Hangzhou University, a mm -hmm. uh, city not far from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, in 1990, my wife came to this country to uh, study law, and I came as a companion. Okay. And uh, one day, I, uh, I think it's 1973 or 1974, I searched uh, uh, I, I had 83, 84. No, I'm sorry, 93. 93, 93. 93, 93, 93, 93, 93 or 94. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, uh, the first time I had the opportunity to uh, use the internet. And I mm -hmm. find uh, from the internet, uh, I realized there was a school in California teaching, uh, I mean, uh, offering mm -hmm. translation courses. And I was trying to, uh, I sent them a message, sent them a letter trying to ask for a job. And mm -hmm. later on, I got this job. A year okay. later. Okay. Yeah. So you've been teaching here now for those yeah, since 16 years. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's 15 or 16, 16 years. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us what's been happening in uh, translator training within China? 
recently. What's the current situation? Well, the current situation well, is hard to to say because there are quite a lot of activities going on there. And uh, but I think one thing I should mention is the uh, uh, the MTI program, the Master of Translation and Interpretation program. It's a it's quite a popular program, and I think right now uh, the n the number of the program is increasing, and uh, at least probably a hundred programs uh, mm -hmm. set up in China, and this is something. Since when? when well, do they start since probably this is you know in the past uh, we uh, we had a few mm -hmm. uh, MTI programs. The famous one is the uh, uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University and Shanghai International Studies mm -hmm. University, but it's only a few. But right now, I think there are so many. And this is maybe up to two or three years, two or three years. So very, very quick development, quick development of, yeah, of uh, new master's level new programs. Master's level, okay. yeah. That's, uh, and uh, this is something new. Okay. And I think uh, it is, I, I don't know, I think in next year we're going to see, we're going to see even more okay. uh, MTI programs. Yeah. Who teaches in these programs? Well, the interesting thing is I'm pretty sure that uh, those who actually teach in the foreign language de department are going to teach in the MTI program. In other words, some of them, some of the instructors actually uh, teach in the foreign language department with a focus on uh, linguistic mm -hmm. literature. Right. literature. Okay. And the same people are going to teach in this uh, MTI program. And I don't know whether we have enough people to do this, do this job uh, to teach in the MTI program in China since we have so many uh, MTR programs. Although you're engaged in uh, training the trainers. That's, uh, that's uh, yeah, as one of the uh, one of the jobs I do in China during the summer is training the trainer program. Uh, actually basically basically uh, the, the people coming to this uh, program most of them, in mm -hmm. all, may, maybe all of them are university Teachers, right. yeah, okay. teachers yeah. So when you do that, train the trainers. Do you what try to give them some knowledge in addition to what they have about the profession or about? Well, about I, uh, you know, my work here basically is text based. Okay. I don't do a lot of uh, you know theoretical things, text based. So what I do is that I sometimes use a uh, uh, a text and. Uh, Demonstrate how to translate uh, uh, okay. to the students. Demonstration. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, what about translation studies or research on translation in China? Is there much being done, and what do you think should be done? I think, as you mentioned a, a, a moment ago, Eugene Nida was well known. Mm -hmm. I think he went to China at the beginning of 1980. Uh, after that, so many. Uh, translation professors and scholars starting doing research based on the Western theory, based on the United theory, yes. and some other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. You know that. Yeah. Uh, I think in terms of of theoretical research, I think uh, they have been doing quite a lot of work there. So, mm -hmm. uh, I what I th think is probably uh, because of this new development, so many MTI MTI programs are you know, uh, being set up, probably the research part should be, uh, we should have a shift from uh, theory-based to uh, the text-based, mm -hmm. uh, in other words, it's applied research uh, versus the, uh, the, the theoretical research, uh, even though I think the theoretical research is, is fine, there's nothing wrong with it, yeah. Uh, I would say that probably uh, the uh, applied research aspect should be emphasized. So the research should help in the training of translators very directly? That, yeah, directly. For example, I think we can, uh, there are quite a lot of things to do uh, in terms of applied research. Uh, for example, you can focus on the text, the text-based research. Uh, we have been paying a lot of attention to a larger units of translation uh, you know, the, 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 the paragraph, the text, uh, the larger units. But I think we, can, we should also be uh, emphasizing the uh, smaller units of translation, 
like the sentence words and the phrases. Uh, for example, the, 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 uh, so far as I know, the, the range of possibilities in translating, in translating different types of text, uh, this is a very important uh, area. And mm -hmm. we need to do a lot of research uh, uh, for translating technical documents. Proper, probably the range is pretty uh, narrow. But for some other types, the the, uh, the range could be very large, and we need to work on that type of type of thing. Chinese culture has a very very long and rich history of translation and thought about translation. Mm. Is there any attempt to go back to those roots or those traditions and recuperate them in terms of a Chinese approach to translation? Uh, well, I think it's a hard question because I. Th if you you're talking about going back, uh, I think it's always good to go back. Oh. It's always good to go back, but uh, at this moment, if you want to have a separate Chinese translation studies, probably it's not very realistic. People have been doing translation based on the European theories for a long time. For a long time, uh, I would say that probably we don't have a separate. Uh, translation study, but we need in the translation study we need to give more emphasis, give more attention to the uh, the Chinese aspect, mm -hmm. the the character, the special features of the Chinese language of the, the Chinese culture, language and okay. culture too. And the culture. Good. I was just thinking, for example, if if you've got Eugene Nida, you have two kinds of equivalents, two concepts. Yes. Yeah. If you go to Yan Fu, you have three. You're right. Yeah. If you start thinking in terms of three, isn't that an entirely different approach? Well, you're talking about the number of approaches, two or three? Well, the number of concepts. I mean, you can think about the problems of translation in a Chinese way, or is yeah, that I agree. very naive? I agree. You know, I, I, I agree. If you have three, it's uh, yeah more specific, I guess, right? Uh, I don't really think it. At least at this time, I don't think it's it's quite uh, easy to compare Yan Fu with Eugene Nida. Okay. Eugene okay. Nida, because I think Eugene Nida is more s systematic. Yan Fu yes. is you know the concepts are great. The three, uh, the three the faithfulness, elegance, or uh, uh -huh. expressing this is pretty good. But the thing is, uh, it's not systematic enough. The Nida theory is at least pretty systematic, right? Okay. And uh, uh, I think we have. I reconsider NIDA. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, recently uh, I was very much influenced by NIDA in the 1980s. Personally, uh, you know, I, I know NIDA very well. Uh, I was influenced by NIDA, but for the past few years, uh, especially after teaching here at the Monterey Institute, I find out probably I, sh I should have a shift from NIDA, uh, not completely. Uh, mm -hmm. Get rid of an Ida, but I sh I think we should more I should modify myself a little bit. Good. I mean, is translation studies too Eurocentric? Uh, and do you think that your work can help open it up? Eurocentric. Make it more for sure. Because yes, okay. most of the research, you know, we can. If you read uh, Meta, if you need read all those translation journals, I think majority of the articles actually are written by Westerners. Yes. Right? For sure. I think more and more Chinese. More, more and more Chinese. Yes. Like 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 uh, yes, yeah, so more and more Chinese, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, Eurocentric, yeah, I think yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think we need to just uh, say something like, you know, we have a Chinese translation study versus Western translation study. I, I don't know. For now, at least I think probably the separation is not needed. Okay. Uh, Professor Ye, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.